Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Each year, the Engineering Society highlights one aspect of Isambard Kingdom Brunel's work. Uh, today's speaker is Dr. Corlett, a marine engineer who is at present engaged in the longest salvage journey ever attempted, the return of the SS Great Britain from the Falkland Islands. Dr. Corlett. Ladies and gentlemen, just under 126 years ago, a ship was launched which had an immense influence upon the development of modern shipping and upon the e economy of this country. I am very pleased as a member of the SS Great Britain project to have been asked to talk about the ship to the Brunel University and their guests and in so doing, perhaps pay a tribute to the memory and work of a very great man, Isambard Kingdom Brunel. We are going to tell you part of a story of a ship that was built by this man, Brunel. We can't tell you the end of it because the story isn't yet quite finished. It's an extraordinary story and none of it would ever have happened if it hadn't been for the genius of this engineer. It really begins in 1838 when Brunel and the Great Western Steamship Company announced that they were going to build a second ship to travel between Great Britain and America. They built a special dry dock here in Bristol and in 1839 they started to build the biggest, the fastest and the most unusual ship that had ever been conceived. By July 1843 she was ready to launch. Imagine, if you can, what amazement the entire population of Bristol must have felt when they saw for the first time this giant ship completed. 322 feet long and almost 3,000 tons. But before we tell you the most extraordinary things about the construction of the Great Britain, because that was and still is her name, let's look at what happened at her launch. Thousands of people turned out, and a great number of them paid a guinea to see the launch, attend a royal banquet, and watch Prince Albert himself take part in the ceremony from a specially constructed pagoda. In fact, she wasn't as much launched as floated. When the water had been let into the dock and the ship was floating inside, the tug started pulling, the rope broke, the lady performing the ceremony dropped her champagne bottle in the water, and Prince Albert saved the day by throwing a reserve bottle and hitting the bow with a resounding crash from 20 feet. The Prince then went back to the station, and by the time they finally got the ship out of the dock, he was halfway back to London. In fact, what with one thing and another, the whole operation was something of a shambles. Luckily, they didn't try to take her down the river that day because, as it turned out, the hull was built five foot six inches wider than the opening through the dock, and it took nearly six months to release her. I'm queen of the waters. The ocean world has never yet seen a sail unfurled like mine or its billowy heaving breast. 
or seabird that carried a prouder crest. What they were celebrating at their banquet, though they didn't know it, was the construction of the first real Atlantic liner. She was covered in gold leaf and decoration, which was all very impressive. But what was so remarkable about the Great Britain was not only that she was the biggest ship in the world, but that Brunel had decided to build her out of iron and that her engine was connected not to paddles but to a screw. These four cylinders were no less than six feet eight inches in diameter. They were connected to a wrought iron crankshaft which turned the drum over 18 feet across, which connected to the propeller shaft by four endless chains. The engine itself weighed 340 tons, and the engine and boiler room together were 117 feet long. There had never been anything like her before. She had a promenade deck built under cover so that passengers could walk about without getting battered by wind and waves. She had a great gallery with windows let into the stern of the ship. Her staterooms accommodated 360 passengers and her dining hall was, by shipping standards, nothing short of sumptuous. Luckily, this man, Fox Talbot, considered it worthwhile to take his newly invented camera all the way to Bristol and photograph her while she was being fitted out. Remember, when you look at this photograph, that it was taken 126 years ago when her engines were actually being fitted. This picture has become enormously valuable, particularly to one man. He is a naval architect, and he knows more about the way the Great Britain was built than any other man living. His name is Dr. Ewan Corlett. This ship really could be said to set the pace for shipbuilding for a hundred years to come. Of course, as a naval architect, I was well aware of this. The thought struck me suddenly, why should we not do something about her? Why should we not uh, che check what condition she is, lying as she is, a hulk in the Falkland Islands? Can we bring her home? At any rate, let us find out and document the ship for posterity so that the details of the design, the details of construction, how Brunel conceived the ship will be known for all time. This is a model of the Great Britain built by Vickers Armstrong so that they could test the hull and measure its performance in a tank. Look at the cliff above. It was the first ever built quite that shape. As Dr. Corlett and the scientists discovered, the hull is very efficient indeed. And remember, there was no such thing as tank testing in 1840. The shipbuilder who actually drew her lines was working purely on experience and the classic rule that what looks right, works right. Her actual shape was the only thing that Brunel didn't work on. The hull that they tested was drawn up by a man called Patterson. And you only have to look at the bow to see that she was built for speed. She had the first large screw propeller and the first simplex rudder, built exactly like modern rudders are today. Vickers also tested the screw and the rudder with scale models, again working in the tank. The propeller weighed four tons. The six flat wrought iron blades were almost 16 feet in diameter. Not very efficient, but as nobody knew anything about propellers in those days, the amazing thing is not that it didn't work well, but that it managed to work at all. And work it did. In January 1845, the Great Britain steamed out of Bristol with her six masts and her distinguished passengers straight into the teeth of a gale. Where most other ships would have broken up, she merely had a couple of plates buckled in the bow and steamed on. Despite the weather, she made 12 and a half knots with her engine turning at 19 revolutions a minute. She arrived in London to a hero's welcome. She was visited by the Queen and she stayed to bask in the glory for five months before setting out on her maiden voyage to Liverpool and on to New York. We don't know how many passengers she carried because the log of that first voyage had been lost. But we do know that burning between 70 and 80 tons of coal a day, she ploughed on, rolling badly and vibrating dramatically through strong headwinds. 
she covered 3,300 miles in 14 days and 21 hours at an average speed of just over nine knots. As she steamed up the East River at New York, she was the first screw-driven ship ever to have made an ocean voyage. She was a success, and her return voyage to Liverpool was completed without any trouble whatsoever. But there was one big problem which nobody realized. The blades on her propeller were working loose. On her next voyage, they started to come off one by one. Eventually, on the way home from New York, she lost five blades out of six and limped home with one. They decided to fit her with a new four-bladed propeller and change her rig from six masts to five. Away she went on two more round trips from Liverpool to New York and back again. It was the fifth voyage that turned out to be disaster. Her captain mistook a lighthouse in bad weather and she went aground on a beach at Dundrum Bay in Northern Ireland. There was talk of abandoning her as a total write-off, but Brunel himself was determined to save her. He wrote to the owners. The finest ship in the world has been left and is lying like a useless saucepan kicking about on the most exposed shore that you can imagine. With no more effort or skill applied to protect the property than the said saucepan would have received on the beach at Brighton. It is really shocking. Brunel designed a breakwater made of faggots to protect the ship during the winter, and despite the most terrible storms, it worked. In the spring, there began the most complicated and tortuous salvage operation to lift her out of the sand and repair her bottom before the high spring tides could lift her and float her over the rocks that surround the beach. They eventually managed it, but the Great Western Steamship Company went broke in the process, and when the Great Britain sailed again, she had been sold to new owners. Gibbs Brighton Company gave her new engines, two funnels, took away another mast, and prepared her for the run between Liverpool and Australia. She had been refitted with no expense spared. The old saloon was turned into cargo space, and a new deck house was built to provide for the 730 passengers. It was comfortable enough, as long as everybody stuck to the rules. Breakfast to be at eight o'clock, and at nine the cloth to be removed, after which nothing will be served. Passengers are requested to allow ladies to occupy the seats most convenient for retiring from the dinner table. In 1852, she set out on the long voyage to Australia. Everyone, including the newspapers, was confident of her success. The Great Britain is fully equipped to resist any attempt to attack the vessel, for she is mounted with six heavy guns and arms and ammunition for a hundred men. It is confidently expected that she will reach Melbourne in 56 days, whereas double that time is considered average for a sailing vessel. In fact, as her log shows, it took her 82 days because she ran out of coal halfway through the voyage. It was this first trip to Melbourne and the return journey home that persuaded her owners to rebuild the boilers and remove yet another mast, bringing her down at the end of the voyage from four masts to three. If you study her log, you'll see that after several trips to Australia, she was hired by the government, and in 1855, she carried 44,000 men to the Crimean War. Two years later, she was rushing troops to quell the Indian mutiny. But her real career was running passengers to Australia. Refitted yet again, she settled down to a regular routine. She published her own newspaper, written and actually printed on board by a member of the crew with a hand press. In Sydney, she became so regular a visitor that everyone accepted her and her skipper, Captain Gray, as part of the local scene. She travelled backwards and forwards, only changing the name of her newspaper, until she finally completed 32 round trips to Australia and was laid up in Liverpool. But it wasn't the end, not quite. She was sold after five years idleness for 6,500 pounds. It was in 1882 when her new owners removed her engines altogether, rigged her as a pure sailing ship and fitted her as a cargo boat. For some reason, they covered her hull in wood, though nobody knows why. In 1886, she started her last voyage to San Francisco, carrying coal. She never arrived. 
She was damaged in a storm rounding Cape Horn and put back for repairs to the Falkland Islands. In Port Stanley, although the damage turned out to be little more than a strained deck, it was decided to write her off as a dead loss. Why they did it is still something of a mystery. But whatever the reason, she was sold to the Falkland Island Company as a hulk and stripped down to become a storehouse for coal and wool. They stripped her of anything valuable that they could lay their hands on, they sold her sails and her rigging, and they cut great holes in her starboard side so that the bales of wool could be loaded on and off without difficulty. It was a sad-looking ship that lay in Port Stanley, and a miserable job for an historic ship like the Great Britain. She stayed here for 47 years until her decks began to leak and there was no use left in her even as a hulk. So they brought tugs and they towed her out of Port Stanley. They took her round the coast to a place called Sparrow Cove and here they found a piece of beach and they ran her ashore. It was supposed to be her last resting place. She was supposed to rust away and fall apart like any other wreck. They banged holes in her stern so that she would sink once and for all and settle in the sand. And that, they thought, was that. But it wasn't. 34 years later, in 1968, she was still here. In this open bay, where all the weather from the Atlantic had swept in year after year, Brunel's construction had held up and survived. For years, visitors looked at that beautiful bow, still majestic even without its bowsprit, and they said, what a pity to leave her there to rot. And some said, why can't she be saved? And nobody did anything, and she went on rotting, though some of her figurehead remained, and her three great masts stood towering up. Great areas of her deck had either rotted or been taken away and used for building. Her deck winches were still there, rusted up, but as sound as the day they were built. One of her yards still hung from her mainmast, and her frames were still in place, just as the shipbuilders had cut them out in 1839 by laboriously drilling hole after hole. All very well to dream of bringing her back to Britain, but when you look at the desolation that time, men and weather had caused, it makes you think that only a fanatical romantic would have the courage actually to try. No decks left at all inside. Nothing but a maze of rusty iron girders, crisscrossing and marking out in space the areas where top-hatted gentlemen and crinolined ladies strolled arm in arm to work up an appetite for dinner. Not so much as a cabin wall or a door to show where the first-class staterooms were, and even the windows in the great stern gallery boarded up where the ladies would sit and sew and gaze out at the long, straight line of her wake. And yet, looking at this hull with its magnificent stern, there were some people who thought that it wasn't an impossible task to bring her home and save her from this final stage of decay. This crack in her side was the biggest problem caused mainly by the hole cut out in her side so that she could be loaded easily as a hulk. Only nobody could tell how bad the crack was and how far under the water it went. In the winter of 1968, Dr. Corlett set out to survey the ship and find out just how badly damaged she was. And to do it, he was offered the valuable help of the British Navy. HMS Endurance is a naval hydrographic survey ship used mainly in the Antarctic. She had aboard all the equipment and all the expert help that was needed, not only to survey the ship itself, but also the water of Sparrow Cove, so that Dr. Corlett could plan not only what equipment would be needed, but also how far in a salvage ship could come. For the crew of Endurance, it turned out to be a labor of love. The whole of this survey was carried out by Dr. Corlett with assistance given by volunteers from HMS Endurance. 
Indeed, uh, when Dr. Corlett was on board, he gave a lecture to the ship's company about the Great Britain. This obviously fired the imagination of the crew, and there was most certainly no shortage of volunteers to help him in his task. They started by surveying the bay itself. As the last survey carried out in this area was made by the crew of a visiting sailing ship, it isn't really surprising that the information on the existing chart wasn't too reliable. And assuming that a salvage ship could get within reach, was there enough water to float the Great Britain and tow her safely out of the bay? Until Endurance and her crew got to work, nobody knew the answers to these vital questions. Stand by. Are you ready? Ready. The answer was yes. There was enough water, they could possibly get salvage equipment in, and they could float her out. But more important than that, assuming that anybody could afford to try, was the problem of the ship itself. Was she in a fit state to be floated? This man provided part of the answer. He is the shipwright of the Endurance, and it was his job with Dr. Corlett to draw a complete plan of the ship's lines as she is now. Something that had never been done before. They had her original design from which she'd been built, but nobody had ever actually measured her as she is. So, knowing how she was built, they then had to discover how much damage there was and how far the erosion of all those years had weakened her structure. And the only way of finding out was to go down and look. This crack in her side was the biggest problem of all. Did it seriously weaken her whole structure? Was her back completely broken? Or could it at least be plugged, if not properly repaired? The answer was not encouraging, but not as bad as they'd feared, as long as something was done soon. The holes in her stern also had to be checked to see if the idea of salvage was at all possible. The Endurance's first officer gave the simple answer. When I first heard of this proposal to take her home to England, I didn't think that the plan stood a dog's chance. But when we had Dr. Corlett aboard talking about it, and I was with him a lot of the time he was doing this survey, I realized it's not such a harebrained scheme, and I am convinced that there is a very, very good chance of getting her back to England. Perhaps one of the most extraordinary parts of this story took place in Britain. This is Basingstoke, where Dr. Corlett has his office and where he works as a regular marine architect, quite apart from his interest in the Great Britain. Two things were required. A plan to make the salvage possible, and secondly, an organization to manage the whole operation and raise a lot of money. It remains now to effect the actual salvage of the vessel. We have carried out a preliminary or a feasibility survey, which was moderately encouraging. And thanks to the generosity of many individuals and concerns, we have the necessary finance. This is Jack Hayward. He has provided the Great Britain project with enough money to bring the ship home. Well, I first saw it in the press. I think it was the Times. Uh, I think it was a letter to the Times. I think all these things started letters to the Times, all these crusades. Um, then they ran a leader article on it that it should be saved. Then I spoke to Dr. David Owen, who was associated with Lundy, the saving of Lundy Island, and he also uh, was involved, or at least uh, had given his blessing to the um, project to bring back the Great Britain as Under Secretary of State for the Navy. And. Um, that's when I was introduced to Mr. Richard Gould Adams and Dr. Ewan Corlett, and from that moment onwards, it was sort of um, all systems go, I think. <laughs> the um, next step is a detailed technical survey, including a salvage survey and formulation of plans in detail for the uh, floating, repair, and tow home. The Falkland Islands, of course, are a very long way away, they're in a wild part of the world in terms of weather, and the ship is old, very old. We must be very careful what we do, and the plans must be very carefully laid. However, I'm hopeful she will come home now. <laughs>
And if she does, it is certain that she will go initially to Bristol to go into the dock in which she was built, and of course, which she fits exactly. You may dismiss it as a mixture of blind faith and optimism. The fact remains that with the ship lying full of water and sand on a beach in the Falkland Islands, the committee under the chairmanship of Richard Gould Adams took it upon themselves to build a template of the ship at its widest point. They set it up in the original dry dock in Bristol to check that it would be possible to get the Great Britain back into the dock in which she was built. With a foot to spare on each side, they were ready to make the final plan. Dr. Corlett had done all he could, and it was now up to another team of men, equipped with some very large and sophisticated equipment. In March this year, a strange convoy crossed the Atlantic and dropped anchor in Sparrow Cove, right alongside the Great Britain. Towed by an ocean-going tug, the Mulus is a floating pontoon of two and a half thousand tons. To understand their plan is simple. To see how they could carry it out is quite another matter. The plan was to put the Great Britain on top of the Mulus and tow them both back to Britain as one complete unit. The Great Britain project had one representative on the spot. He was Lord Strathcona. Uh, we arrived here early this morning and I represent the Great Britain Project Committee, which has chartered two ships from an Anglo-German salvage consortium. There's the converted stern trawler Varius and an enormous pontoon called Mulus the Mule. And we are now lying alongside the hulk of the Great Britain, where the 15-man crew of the ship and the five people from the salvage firm in Southampton will be working certainly for the next two weeks. Uh, we think the whole job will take us about a month. Uh, our first task will be to get the masts out of the ship and to start patching some of the holes. And when we finally got ourselves secured today, we're hoping to get on with that particular work first thing tomorrow morning. But before anybody could start any work at all, it was necessary to replace some of the timber on the ship's deck so that there was at least some kind of platform to work on. This was a job that could be done by a party of volunteers from the Royal Marines, stationed in the Falkland Islands. They worked very fast indeed. Apart from the Marines, there were two teams of experts. Leslie O'Neill was in charge of floating the Great Britain, also responsible for all the pumps and gear sent out to repair the hull and get it off the beach. Horst Cowlin was in charge of the pontoon, and incidentally it was his job to lower the great spar still remaining, and also the three enormous wooden masts. It is hard to appreciate just how big these masts are until you see the size of a man in relation to them. In fact, they're the biggest wooden masts ever built. They had to cut the yard away with an oxyacetylene torch because the metal parts holding it up had rusted solid. Now this spar weighs over eight tons. It's 105 feet long, and if they made a mistake and it dropped, the whole project would be over, because it would cut the ship virtually in half. three masts out of her was an even bigger and more dangerous job. <laughs> 
they brought the mulus close up alongside. The idea was to use the same technique that the old square-rigged sailors used when they wanted to lift a mast in some deserted place with no crane. They used shear legs. At the same time, the divers prepared to start patching the holes made in the stern in 1937. From inside, it looks a fairly impossible task. But they used a very simple system. They cut sheets of ordinary plywood so that they would fit and overlap the holes. These sheets were drilled and bolted through to clamps attached on the inside of the ship. Of course, plywood isn't strong enough on its own, but once in place, it's no very great problem to cover the whole area and bury the holes with a patch made out of good, strong concrete. The plan worked well, and within a matter of hours, where the sea had been surging in and out, the hull was completely watertight. This part, at any rate. The shear legs were up and attached, and now they were ready to start lifting. Take into account that the step of a mast like this is placed well down inside the ship, and a lot of mast has to be lifted out before they can swing it clear and over the side. And as it happened, it didn't work out quite as they expected. They had refurbished that deck house themselves as somewhere nice and comfortable to eat their breakfast. That was only the small mizzen mast, and that might easily have been a lot worse if somebody had been in the way. The main mast, probably the biggest wooden mast in the world, weighs 30 tons. Horst decided that discretion was the better part of getting home in one piece, and gave orders for a chainsaw to be obtained and the mast cut off just above the level of the deck. They attached the hoist and then with just enough lift on the winches to hold it upright, they began to cut away the metal stays. They were hoping for just enough wind to blow it in the right direction. Of course, when they wanted it, the wind died and the mast stayed resolutely upright. So they hammered in wedges instead. Two down and one to go. The Great Britain was built with six masts. During her career, she lost three of them in 40 years, finishing up as a three-masted ship. Now she was to lose her other three masts in less than a week. With the Great Britain still firmly on the bottom, they moved the giant pontoon further along towards the bow and set up the shear legs directly alongside the foremast. Again, they cut the stays. And again, they used the saw. With the hull now lighter by many tons, the job of getting the ship afloat became a good deal easier. Nevertheless, the prospect of putting one of these two giant objects on top of the other still looked like a formidable task. <laughs> 
The system basically required that the Great Britain should float while the Mulus should sink. Then, with the Great Britain exactly over the top of the Mulus, they could refloat the pontoon. Only to do it, the Great Britain had to float, and to achieve that, they had to close that crack. They used a system as old as Trafalgar, and probably a lot older than that. With plywood put across the face of the crack, they lowered mattresses into the water, hauled them down and stuffed them, one after the other, into the open space. Now you may wonder why they didn't use concrete like they did with the holes in the stern. But the crack is different. If the ship floats, instead of lying on an uneven bed of sand and rock, she'll be supported evenly all the way along. The gap should close and the mattresses will be trapped, making a watertight join. They were now getting nearer the critical stage. Uh, we've now been here about 10 days. And as you see, we've made quite a number of preparations before we try and reflate the ship. Uh, we've taken out the masts. We've patched, we hope, most of the holes in the hull. But the, uh, in particular, at the moment, we are putting large steel straps across the crack in the starboard side. These great steel plates were measured, cut, and fixed into the structure of the ship across the split. The idea being that when she floats and the gap closes, they can tighten up the bolts and hold her together so that the gap can never open up again. If the pumps can empty her out and she does come up, There'll be men standing by to bolt these plates firmly into place. Uh, this has been particularly necessary because our original plan, whereby we were going to pump the after part of the ship in the hopes of closing the crack, has been at least temporarily abandoned, uh, as the bulkhead in the middle of the ship proved not to be sound enough to be worth trying to repair. So at the moment, we're making final adjustments before we start the pumps to try and refloat the old Great Britain after 30 odd years lying in Sparrow Cove. And so it started at last. While everyone was praying that the water was coming out quicker than it was going in, they moved the mulas to a spot some distance away where the bottom was exactly the right depth, and here they began the most enormous disappearing trick. The endurance had already surveyed the whole area 18 months before. The important thing was to make sure that the mulus was placed exactly over the one possible spot. Finally, they opened the air vents in the great buoyancy tanks, and like a vast submarine submerging, the mulus, complete with its gear, its winches and everything else, slid below the surface and settled gently and firmly on the bottom.
With its tall metal poles sticking out of the water, the spot was marked exactly for the Great Britain to float over the top of the Mulet. The question still was, would the Great Britain float tomorrow? The tug lay off in deeper water for the night and they waited. It should have happened the next day. Quite suddenly, when nobody was expecting it, and with hardly a wire made fast to hold her, she was up. The Great Britain was afloat again. They found wires just in time, and they made her safe before she floated away. With a small tug alongside her, they were ready for the last stage, in some ways the most difficult of all. To get this great, rusty, leaking monster exactly in the right place on top of the mulus, taking into account that she may be floating now, but nobody knows how much damage she may have had underneath, and nobody knows how strong she is. She could simply sink where she is at any moment. They flew the ensign of the Falkland Islands from her stern, and very slowly they nudged her, a foot at a time this way, and an inch at a time that way. It's no easy task to move a big ship like the Great Britain in the open sea onto a spot so exact that a matter of inches makes the difference between success and failure. Finally, they were satisfied. She was over the top and the next stage could begin. Horst Cowlin, the salvage engineer, explains how they did it. The pontoon was now full up with water and stay flat on the ground. And the Great Britain was refloating and come now inside between the dolphins on the right position on the pontoon. And now we start this air pump inside and the bow from the pontoon. And after three hours, maybe, comes the pontoon up with a great Britain. After 12 or 15 hours more, the air has come over the middle from the pontoon and that was a difficult point when the pontoon start and will come free from the bottom. And we watch it with divers what side come first and so it was on one side more and so we bring more air in this side and the pontoon come back and come just free from the bottom now, so it was uh, easy to bring up and to the Great Britain together. And after 24 hours, the pontoon was free of the water, and now we kept to bring all water out, check all tanks, new around the pontoon, and now he's uh, swimming, safety, there's no list. She was actually standing there, high and dry, out of the water, and yet afloat. 
On the 14th of April, the Great Britain left Sparrow Cove. She sailed out and round the corner and back into Port Stanley. A dramatic sight for the islanders and particularly for the men who took her the other way as a hulk back in 1937. There were some who said that it couldn't be done, and some who were sure that it shouldn't be done. There were very few indeed who thought that it would ever actually happen. But it did. The Great Britain was back in harbour, temporarily. Uh, well, we've been in the Falkland Islands now for four weeks, and the last ten days we've been in Stanley. Um, our biggest problem has probably been the weather, we were warned about this before we started the operation, but uh, not having been initiated, we never really appreciated just quite how many problems this could create, and it certainly managed to create most of them for us. Uh, in spite of this, uh, Mr. O'Neill and Horst Cowlin, who have been leading the salvage party, have surmounted all their problems and achieved a really fabulous amount in this time. They welded her down onto the pontoon. They put in wedges and props. They attached wires and hold them tight. They fastened down so securely that she became part of the pontoon itself. Nothing was going to move her now that they had her aboard. think and hope that we've arrived at the situation whereby we're ready to continue voyage number 47 for the Great Britain after a lapse of 86 years. It's a long way from the Falkland Islands to Bristol, about 9,000 miles in fact, a very long way to come home. And this is really as far as the story goes. It isn't over yet. At this very moment, the Great Britain is still on her way. What will happen to her when she arrives? Well, that's another story. It'll need a lot of money to bring her back to the condition she was in the last time she was in Bristol. And at the moment, there isn't much money available. It's already been quite a triumph for the men who had the mad idea of salvaging the SS Great Britain. But when you look at that great, solid hull, and remember how long it is since she was built, perhaps the real honour should go to the man who built her, Isambard Kingdom Brunel. <laughs> 